Thank you everyone for joining us today for MNO Convergence Challenges, challenges to network operators as the exploding demand drives network needs. Um, before we begin the program today, um, I did want to go over a couple of items to help you get the most out of the program. Um, if you are logged in at a computer, you do have a control panel window. In that control panel window, you will see that there are, is an opportunity for you to ask questions as well as chat, meaning you can, um, if you're having any kind of sound issues or can't hear us for whatever reason, uh, feel free to um, reach out to uh, the organizers through the chat window to let us know of those issues. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the question window. Uh, we will try to address them either during our program or immediately following. Um, and uh, please be advised that all attendees are on mute. So I, unfortunately, we won't be able to hear you. Uh, so those are the two best ways to communicate uh, with us today. So thank you so much for that. Um, in addition, uh, we do have some polling questions throughout our program, as well as a handout of this presentation, should you wish to have a copy of that for your files. So um, before I get started and introduce our esteemed uh, presenters today, I wanted to introduce NEDES. This is a NEDES webinar program. We produce webinars as well as events and podcasts and newsletters. Um, we are an organization that sits at the intersection of wireline and wireless infrastructure and really focus on some of the developing concerns and challenges with converging network infrastructure deployments uh, in order for us to be able to do what we need to um, and what is expected from 5G and other emerging technologies. Uh, so I uh, appreciate your, your time and I uh, urge you to, to check out more information about NEDAS. Simply visit www.nedas.com. Now it is my pleasure uh, to introduce our presenters. I will start uh, with Walter Cannon, who is the Vice President of Business Development for Zenfine Networks. Um, he leverages um, quite an extensive uh, uh, years of experience, definitely over 25 years of technology experience in the space. Um, and he has been part of the Zenfi Networks team uh, since pretty much since day one. So, um, you know, kudos to, to Walter and the rest of the team for all that they, they do. Um, our other presenter today is Kishore Raja with Boingo, and Kishore Raja is the Vice President of Engineering Strategic Programs at Boingo. Um, he's responsible for executing and managing some of their most strategic initiatives, including 5G, Wi-Fi, LTE, NFB, and SDN, and IoT. Uh, so we're really honored to have you here today, Raja, and what you and Boingo are doing are, are really uh, tremendous, so thank you. Um, as we move on here, um, I do want to give an overview of today's program. Uh, the program today, uh, you can see here, we're going to hear a little bit more about Zenfi Networks and Boingo uh, from Walter and from Kishore. And then we'll be going into our presentation. Our presentation is meant to be for uh, discussion purposes. We are not going to be presenting to you today, but rather having a discussion about what we are going to be showing you. Uh, so I do uh, think that this format will be terrific for everybody, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, I also did want to mention that this program is based off of a HetNet Forum published white paper uh, that was published in August of 2019. That white paper is titled, DAS and Small Cells Evolve to Meet Today's and Tomorrow's Connectivity Needs. It was authored by a variety of industry leaders, including Boingo and Zenfi, ne Zenfi Networks. And I want to thank the Wireless Infrastructure Association uh, the WIA and the HeadNet Forum for their mission to drive education, awareness, and insights to enable connectivity for the future. Uh, so thank you so much for, for taking part in that. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Walter Cannon, who will introduce you to Zenfi Networks. Hello, <clears throat> Hello everyone. Uh, sorry for my voice. Uh, Thank you uh, for joining. Uh, we really appreciate you taking out time from your busy schedules, uh, especially with the holidays coming. I'd like to talk to you a little about, about Zenfi Networks. Um, 
don't know if you've heard of us, we are a communications infrastructure provider based in New York City. Um, this is actually what I like to call our version two of the company. We had a company prior to this called Lex and Metro Connect. Um, we started Zenfi Networks with the premise of two main things. One is with our first version, we understood, we came to learn what was happening in the wireless community and what others had done uh, right and wrong. And we wanted to try to address it with some new architecture. So um, with that said, we uh, designed some new architecture from a physical standpoint and started building what we like to call a neighborhood of network na neighborhoods that are all intertwined but can service um, different, different areas of New York City where we started and now also doing it in New Jersey. Uh, we happen to work with most of the major MNOs um, in, uh, in providing them with physical communications infrastructure, space power and connectivity, and integrated into this network is uh, also what we call network edge co-location facilities. So um, with that said, we've been growing. Uh, we've brought a lot of knowledge and we like to talk to you about some of the things that we've learned. As you see from the chart, uh, we have grown a lot in the last uh, since 2014 and we're continuing to build uh, and expand our network and densify our network. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and Kishore, it would be great if you could do the honor to introduce Boingo. Thanks, Alyssa. Good morning and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining the, the webinar. So most of you probably know Boingo as a Wi-Fi service uh, provider but we do a lot more than that. So it's been close to 20 years since we've been uh, deploying different types of wireless technologies in uh, many of the indoor venues. So our main mission is to solve connectivity, allow uh, people and things to connect seamlessly and securely um, in uh, a variety of uh, places like airports and convention centers, military bases, and we, we, uh, we are the largest indoor DAS uh, provider so far. We also pioneered um, Wi-Fi and Passpoint technologies back in 2013. And we have many uh, commercial venues with the Passpoint deployment right now. Obviously, we have uh, more than uh, several uh, millions of uh, users connecting at these uh, venues. Uh, flipping on the, the military side, we have more than 300,000 beds that we serve in uh, different uh, military bases. Uh, Marine Corps, Army, and Air Force. Uh, worldwide, we have uh, more than a million hotspots, uh, including uh, uh, roaming agreements with uh, several uh, operators, MNOs, MVNOs, cable companies, uh, and obviously, uh, you know, we are right in the middle of deploying uh, 5G networks at many of these uh, venues. And uh, looking forward to uh, in this uh, communication era, where there's a demand for connectivity. Um, uh, especially in indoor venues where more than 80% of the connectivity happens indoors. That's where we are trying to solve those problems at Boingo. Excellent. Thank you so much. So, you know, why are we talking about this? You know, 5G is surrounded by hype and its big promises, but, but what is the reality of building truly 5G capable networks? So that's really what we're talking about today. And there are aspects of 5G um, that are driving network changes that we need to understand a little bit better and, and particularly why they take so much time to implement. Um, I do have a polling question. You know, want to uh, ask everyone here uh, who's on our, our call today, what do you think uh, the major driver is hyping 5G? I'll give this about 30 seconds and then we'll close that poll and we'll move on. All right, I'll be closing that poll. Last chance here. Terrific. All right, I'll share the results. I think it's very uh, interesting for us to see. Um, you know, definitely there's general demand for mobile connectivity. That is a key driver. Um, the promise of 5G is certainly something that is driving that, and, and I appreciate those who are uncertain. Um, but one of the major drivers that we're going to talk about is overall demand. So thank you to uh, the 56% here. Uh, demand for mobile connectivity is skyrocketing, and it will only continue to grow as more and more devices are introduced. 
And as a result, um, you know, want to talk to uh, this growing mobile demand and ask our panelists, you know, why can't we meet this demand with the networks we have in place today? I'll start with you, Walter, if that's okay. Yeah, so one of the things that we're seeing, because, you know, again, we work with most of the major supporting on the MNOs and most of the 3PO's and neutral hosts out there. And also, interestingly enough, um, we're getting a lot of, act, we have a lot of activity and opportunity with uh, private property owners, uh, major real estate developers. Um, they um, have a need for supporting a couple different things. Um, so anything wireless, whether it be outdoor, fast, small cell, or public Wi-Fi, um, we are constantly, our communications infrastructure supports that, as well as in-building DAS. And why is that? Well, with the on um, sort of uh, 5G networks coming, and the more and more mobile devices are growing, and, and need for wireless connectivity, including you know streaming, the, the coming of everything from IoT to you know smart cities, healthcare, we see that there's a more and more need for a converged infrastructure that can support all of that. And so we continue to see. Uh, a need for that while there are some concerns and some um, challenges with using migrating to these networks and also dealing with some of the capital expenditure issues and ongoing operating issues. That's why we believe that that will continue to converge onto one physical network um, with sh shared space and power. We've run into some of these challenges already with some of our customers and we continue to try to address them by doing unique things. And, you know, so, you know, with, with a focus, Empire, your focus is on on the fiber side, right? And um, when we take a look at what you're doing and, and connecting all of these sites, you know, why do we need so many wireless sites? And, you know, <laughs> I think, you know, someone's asked me recently, are we going to have a small cell on every single corner? Um, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about that, Kishore, from your perspective, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess the, the general demand for uh, connectivity and data consumption is what's driving all of these, right? And then you get into uh, specifics about, okay, now I, uh, I, have, uh, I have data to consume, but do I consume that on a licensed spectrum? Is that going to be unlicensed spectrum? Or is that going to be a, a, a thing like an IoT? But for, from an average consumer perspective, they don't really care where they connect to or how they connect to. Well, they do care where they connect to, but it doesn't matter what technology they use as long as they, they, they connect seamlessly. So flipping that uh, concept into a spectrum map, as you can see on the screen, so you have the spectrum map going all the way from uh, the lower few kilohertz to 100 gigahertz or higher than that. So, so far, with all the devices you have in the market, be it a smartphone, tablet, um, e-reader, or a laptop, or any of the IoT device, they usually uh, broadcast and connect between zero kilohertz to six gigahertz on an average. There are a few exceptions, but most devices are in that range. What is happening is the, the ever-growing number of devices is causing uh, the limit in the spectrum. So, the, the six gigahertz of spectrum is unfortunately not able to keep up with the demand of the devices. So we need spectrum expansion, which is uh, an obvious evolution. And that's where you see the, the higher band spectrums getting into a centimeter wave and a millimeter wave. Uh, so carriers like AT&T and Verizon, uh, you know, have started to deploy in 28 gigahertz, 36 gigahertz. But you also have uh, certain carriers on the low and the mid band spectrum like T-Mobile, for instance, with the band 71 on 600 megahertz, and Sprint, of course, in the mid-band spectrum on uh, band 41, which is 2.5 gigahertz. So basically what it means is to, um, to support the ever-growing demand for data consumption, you have to do two things. One is expand spectrum, find new ways to create bandwidth. And second one is uh, in the existing spectrum, use creative ways to uh, uh, find uh, different mechanisms to uh, deploy. And that's where 5G is headed. So 5G is really not uh, one uh, technology. It's really a combination of multiple things that makes the, uh, the, the, the deployment and the connectivity and data consumption in these uh, dense venues, like indoor venues, make happen. And one of the stats I talked about earlier is that 
80% of the data gets consumed indoors. At the same time, almost 80% of the indoor venues are unconnected. So this uh, demand for the data is so much in the, uh, the dense areas, we need to have this uh, spectrum expansion. Excellent. That's really insightful. And so, you know, if, if the higher bands needed to support capacity and speed increases are limited to a few blocks, uh, are, are we going to be able to be mobile? I mean, you know, I know that, you know, typical users, right, you, you'll have your calls dropped if you walk down the street or, or out of sight. How does that work? Yeah, that's a good question, uh, Alyssa. That's why uh, uh, one of the uh, the concepts that we believe in uh, when we deploy a connectivity solution in an indoor venue is the concept of convergence. So it, it's really not one technology. It's really a combination of uh, technologies that, that make uh, the connectivity seamless for the user. Uh, so one of the examples is uh, most of the carriers these days have a Wi-Fi calling enabled. So when the user is on a call, when they start, let's say, walking into an airport, the call automatically gets transitioned into uh, the airport Wi-Fi, and this this is seamless to the user. If there is an interruption in the service, that's when it gets uh, noticed uh, by the user, and that's what would cause the problem. So you're actually connecting from a, a macro, a tower cellular network to perhaps a DAS, and then into Wi-Fi, and then back into DAS, and back into towers. So it's really the convergence that, that makes the uh, the difference. And what you're seeing here in this slide is uh, what I talked uh, earlier as well, more spectrum, more technologies, both in the, the low band, uh, mid band spectrum, as well as in the, uh, the, the, the higher band spectrum. And of course, you also asked about, uh, hey, how do you address the, the millimeter wave? Because it's really short range. There are certain areas where uh, uh, deploying a, a short range high capacity, high bandwidth millimeter would make sense. Yes, it does have an issue right now with, with the range as well as being mobile, but I think evolution will uh, take it to a, a, a place where it can be mobile with the concept of reflection, where it can actually bounce off of walls and things. But right now, millimeter wave is added in areas where uh, high capacity is needed and it will be augmented with the existing deployments over there. Interesting. So how do these varying options then mean for, for actual infrastructure deployment if you're, if you're trying to figure out how to work with short range, high capacity, long range, et cetera, right? How do you guys deal with that over at Zenfi, Walter? Yeah, so a couple of things I want to uh, make sure. So as we support our customers and we, you know, we see this continued growth and demand for 5G, or any actually any type of wireless solution, I, we definitely see, in, at least in the mobile in the metropolitan area of New York City, that it is becoming uh, denser and denser. Um, we are building our network to support you know connectivity at any major intersection, and not just with fiber, but with power and space. So why do I say that? You know, there's a there's a lot of things that is happening. Some of them strategic, um, but at the tactical level, whether it be spectrum management or the connectivity, and then the actual physical construction and connectivity communications infrastructure that supports it, we see that it's going to have to continue to do, do it. And this is not what we're doing from a you know field of dreams thing. We're doing it because our customers are requiring us to do it, because their customers are requiring us to do it. You know, when working with the mobile carriers. They're really concerned with quality of service because the guy walking down the street that's listening to his Spotify playlist doesn't want to lose it when he goes in the building or when he crosses, you know, from one street to another. So in our, you know, the, in the dense canyons of New York City, we continue to see more and more um, mobile densification. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's not just for just anything mo mobile, any, I would like to say anything wireless, both public Wi-Fi as well as um, small cell and support for uh, traditional ODAS. Yeah, and, and you know, part of, you know, why, why you're so involved and Zenfi is so involved in this is that it's not just the wireline providers that need fiber solutions. Uh, the wireless providers also need fiber backhaul networks in place. 
Um, and so the question that I had was, why can't they supplement existing infrastructure instead of, instead of building that new infrastructure for this, Wally? So yeah, thanks. That, that's a good point. So uh, you know, there's some challenges with that we know from having been involved in this in the infrastructure business uh, since 2002. At really, that we understand that there's some challenges in the old legacy networks. Um, everything from stranded fiber to as you know where the fiber is and to um, counts of fiber. When you think about it, some of the deployments that we're doing are requiring that we, the, the desire of the mobile provider, of the wireless provider is that we're providing connectivity could be up to every block in New York City. Um, so how do you do that from a physical infrastructure? So we thought that in, there's a need for an additional type of new infrastructure to happen. Um, and this is just the challenges that all of the carriers are, are facing, right? All of the uh, communications infrastructure companies are facing at this time, uh, causing them to have to either build and augment. Yes, you can do it, but uh, that's very capital intensive, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we think that you're going to have to continue to modify this. So, yeah, sure. Um, as Kishore said, you might be able to supplement it with some type of millimeter wave connectivity, but at the end of the day, um, our the requirements that we that we're seeing from most mostly everyone is um, some type of fiber connectivity. Got it, got it. So b before we move on, we're going to get into something a little bit. It's slightly technical, right? Which is, uh, you know, what is the difference between front hall and back hall network deployments? Because we're going to be talking about that, and just wanted to get a sense from our participants on today's call if you happen to know the difference between front hall and back hall network deployments. We'll give you another five seconds there. All right, we'll be closing the poll. Thanks so much for participating. It's great to see that we have the majority of our listeners today um, know the difference between front hall and back hall. Um, we have few that don't, and uh, others uh, will certainly learn a little bit more about that. So why don't you take us through what a that converged architecture looks like, Walter? Yeah, so since everyone understands it, you know, that, 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 then I believe they can appreciate some of the challenges that are, are happening today. Uh, when you consider the source that you're going to have these networks, almost like a mesh network in a neighborhood, and a lot of them, and Keyshore could probably speak more to this, is due to signal source requirements from a distance limitation, or the fact that today a lot of people are using um, connecting back to the macro sites or other types of signal sources that are in those neighborhoods while they can't get back to their core switches. So what we believe um, that as you converge these networks and there's gonna be a bigger, bigger uh, requirement for front hall today, because um, you're gonna have more devices on more corners, we continue to grow the networks. And in addition to that, we see there's a need for network edge co-location facilities that, act, that we can deploy strategically in certain neighborhoods to help house single sources for, um, you know, the major carriers, 3POs. Um, and I'd like to say one more thing. This network that we're continuing to build is, all, is also providing and helping provide other types of resources. While we're not talking about it on the panel today, you know, there's more fiber accessibility in neighborhoods or in mobile in areas that have been forgotten or have not had that type of connectivity in the past so you know when we were when we were preparing for um, today's program um, I asked you a challenging question and um, I'm going to ask it here for you as well and I'm going to go to the next slide which is um, how do we know this will all work <laughs> Uh, without reading the slide, you know, look, it, it works today, right? So if you think about the way that um, traditionally tel um, telco companies have deployed um, signals and provide services to their customers from the vertical tower, we're just trying to lay that tower on horizontally now 
and put on different layers of connectivity. Um, as we see in the slide, as uh, put out in the slide, you know, everything from front hall network is which is connecting a signal source um, to a remote radio head or a small cell device or outdoor data device rather, um, or even to, you know, connectivity for smart furniture or in enterprise connectivity, whatever it is doing, we see that that's happening today. So we really look at, um, there's two ways you can skin this cat tactically from a physical layer, which is, you know, from providing integrated power space and connectivity. Cool. That 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 sounds interesting, and that's definitely solving the problem. You know, outside. Not sure if my my calls will or won't drop, right? As we discussed earlier on this call, but um, shifting a little bit. You know, inside. Uh, you know, wanted to to talk about what's required about bringing convergence indoors. Um, and Keyshore, from the Boingo perspective, I, I think that uh, this slide, uh, you know, helps explain a little bit about that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, as I mentioned before, uh, having the the concept of convergence is really key for a a good uh, experience, a quality uh, experience to the customer. Uh, doesn't matter who that customer is. It could be a a, a user, a, a human on a smartphone, or maybe a connected thing like an IoT. If you don't have that always and seamless continuous connectivity it's not going to be a quality experience uh, for the user. So to make that achieve, you really need to have, you need to really have the, uh, the venue deployment and the, the technologies and everything that Walter talked about as well from both from a power perspective, from backend perspective, the antenna placement, and as well as uh, there's one other thing that I want to uh, just highlight, uh, which would complement to uh, what Walter has been saying so far is, the concept of having uh, these individual functions virtualized using software, uh, because this amazing uh, amount of things you can achieve with automation and uh, a software, which we have seen uh, 3GPP has now adopted uh, containers and uh, the software automation for the deployment, which shows how far uh, we have come uh, both from a, uh, the software perspective as well as getting that into the telecom industry. Alyssa, can I add something here? Um, uh, so, you know, we um, have seen a huge increase from before, uh, when we first started Lex, uh, sorry, Zenfi, we thought about getting into the inbuilding DAS and trying to provide a uh, total solution all the way, you know, to the desk. And what we saw was there was not the right uh, technology for in building solutions yet. Now, uh, the vendor, the DAS vendors are starting to um, come up with the right solutions, if you will. And we see there's a growth in at least in uh, the wantiness of the, actually the real estate owners themselves to want to uh, deploy in building DAS solutions based on a CRAM model. And that's really what we try to show uh, with the slide as well when we talking about it with the HetNet Forum. We have a huge interest right now with a lot of the major real estate developers that own multiple buildings and understand that 5G is coming, understand that there will be some issues with um, where they used to get support from macro sites and, and have, you know, the cell phone service might not be as well, um, as good as before. They understand that they have to deploy some type of support for wireless applications in in it in their buildings. Um, that can be solved whether it's using you know the traditional in building DAS is, that's that's evolving. Um, and Kishore, you could talk a lot more about this, but CBRS is definitely something that we see um, that is helping to virtualize the signal source. Uh, we believe that that will also have a need for fiber connectivity as well. Yeah, so why don't we talk about that, right? The, the, you, you, there's so many different options and challenges and opportunities. What do you see, Kishore, as the biggest challenge to enabling indoor wireless? All right, so so this slide talks about uh, how can you take a existing or a new technology and apply to market uh, use cases. 
because the technology is only as good as uh, uh, the market cases and uh, some type of monetization. So starting from the left side, you have the unlicensed uh, technologies, uh, Wi-Fi and specifically Passpoint. So uh, we've seen a tremendous uh, success in deploying uh, a mass Passpoint and Wi-Fi in some of the large venues like airports and uh, military bases. So for a connected enterprise, as well as situation where users can bring their own uh, devices. And of course, not to uh, forget the, the MDU and the residential uh, areas where Wi-Fi still shines a lot. And Wi-Fi is also um, uh, getting into a lot of uh, commercial enterprise uh, venues, including some of the private and tenant services that you see in uh, the airline uh, lounges. Now then, uh, flip to uh, 5G. I mean, 5G, obviously, most of us uh, know uh, where we are headed towards. But there are some key market uh, use cases that 5G is adding, which is mentioned here. One is the enhanced mobile broadband. So anything from augmented reality to virtual reality that requires really massive amounts of uh, data and bandwidth, um, uh, much more than 20, uh, 20 megahertz that we have seen in the, the 4G and the LTE deployments, and perhaps even much more than the, the carrier aggregation. Uh, because when you get into millimeter wave, you talk about uh, multi gigahertz of uh, bandwidth. At the same time, on the flip side, you also have machine communication, uh, whether it's a massive machine communication for billions of uh, things like IOTs, or it's a critical um, communication for the machines like robotics where you need sub millisecond latency. It's not really about the, uh, the bandwidth over there. You can literally achieve that in five megahertz uh, uh, bandwidth, uh, channel bandwidth, but you're looking at uh, something uh, uh, like a 10 or 5 milliseconds or lower latency for that instant communication, right? So now uh, put all of these together, uh, the, the, it's opening up a new set of uh, use cases, especially in, in the private networks area. And as Walter already uh, mentioned that CBRS is taking the lead uh, when it comes to uh, the private LTE uh, use cases. So one of the examples I can talk about is Let's say that you have a concession within an airport. Um, um, a point of uh, point of sale is uh, one of the example. Um, in a point of sale terminal, you want to make sure that when the user swipes a credit card, the transaction happens right there securely at that moment without any interruption. So one of the best ways to, uh, to achieve this is to set up a private network. Uh, separate from the uh, the mainstream network in the venue, separate from the public network in the venue, so this way it has its own SLA and the quality of service, as well as it has to be secure. So CBRS uh, is where uh, it's perfectly suited to address some of those uh, private LTE use cases. And then last but not the least is uh, we already talked about uh, the billions of IoT uh, devices and the kind of automation they can do in uh, um, you know, uh, MDU uh, scenarios, as well as utility management, uh, even in commercial airports, asset tracking, uh, and uh, that's where uh, narrowband IoT uh, and uh, the different uh, IoT technologies, including things like uh, LoRa, ZigBee, and Z-Way will come into play. Got it. And so, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, wanted to touch upon was how the converged model fits with CRAN um, and, and neutral hosts. So can you talk a little bit about that? And we have uh, a slide here uh, that we prepared to help explain a little bit. Yeah, that's a good question, uh, Alyssa. So let me let, uh, touch on that point and then highlight on this slide. So the radio access network, RAN, has gone through a, a quite a bit of evolution in the past few years. Uh, Walter and you already talked about uh, CRAN, uh, which I agree has been uh, the basis for many of the deployments uh, the carriers are uh, looking uh, forward. But there's also um, uh, DRAN um, technologies like LAA, which is allowing to utilize um, um, the existing uh, 4G LTE deployments as well as the upcoming 5G deployments for a specific scenario. There could be scenarios in the venue where uh, the carriers want to deploy a, a DRAN style of um, uh, deployment augmenting on the existing uh, DAS, as well as, uh, let's say, in a venue where the carriers already have uh, a control uh, frequency uh, from an LTE perspective, but would like to augment the venue's uh, additional frequency for more capacity. So technologies like LAA would augment the existing DAS deployments over there. 
So putting all that into perspective, what this slide talks about is where all of these uh, different uh, spectrum um, technologies uh, fall into and what type of applications they can be uh, used. So um, obviously you have the license spectrum, which is the carrier's, uh, carrier owned uh, and leased and licensed spectrum. Uh, then you have, uh, I'm going to flip to the right side, you have the unlicensed spectrum, uh, anything in 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, 60 gigahertz, upcoming 6 gigahertz, uh, and then you have the, the shared license spectrum, uh, what we call as a shared exclusive. It's, it's basically a tiered model that CBRS is following right now, uh, and uh, we have the upcoming auction from FCC on um, I believe it's on June 25, uh, 2020 for the, the PAL auctions for the CBRS. So you have about 150 megahertz of uh, spectrum. I'm going to talk about that in the subsequent slides. But just to highlight uh, the key aspect here is that anything in the lower spectrum, one gigahertz or lower, is good for long range deployments because of the spectrum characteristics. That's why it's suitable for IoT style of devices because it's a much longer range and shorter bandwidth. You know, you can send data in like a few kilobytes to maybe uh, one megabyte at the most. Uh, the the mid-band, uh, which is between one and six gigahertz, is suitable for a mobile broadband and, you know, all types of mission-critical applications. And anything higher than six gigahertz, getting into centimeter wave and millimeter wave, is for very high bandwidth and short range, which is suitable for areas where you have, to, uh, you have a need to consume a lot of uh, data. Excellent. And I know that, uh, you know, we wanted to also illustrate, you know, the solution in practice here. Um, so why don't, you know, why don't, why don't you, Walter, kind of talk a little bit about the actual install and solution and, and how things are performing from, uh, from, from this new network design perspective? Yeah, great. Uh, so what we have actually working today, um, this slide, and what, this is actually sort of an example of what we are doing today with our with our customers. Again, uh, supporting the neutral host or uh, private developers. You know, it could, we're building private physical networks for them to have a converged uh, communications over one infrastructure. Um, we are housing the the network edge co-location facility. We're housing the actual carrier signal sources. You know, we have all the major carriers in there today, um, providing a front hall to a multitude of buildings or a multitude, it could even be smart furniture, or it could be that same source could be used to support, you know, outdoor connectivity as well, whether it be, you know, supporting their outdoor data solutions. So. Today, this picture that you see here before you is, is the actual solution that we're deploying today, and it's working with our customers today. Excellent. And, and I know Keyshore. Uh, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Walter. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was uh, thinking, you know, and one of the reasons for doing this is that it saves a considerable amount of money and provides efficiency in the network. Um, if you think about that, the old way of doing these types of solutions, um, it would require you to house in every one of the buildings, you know, some type of um, signal source or uh, and, and more carrier equipment. In this one, all of the carrier equipment is shared and it actually is stored at our network edge co-location facility and we're, providing and taking up minimal space in all of these locations. So it's really helping making uh, the customer's so solution more effective and more efficient. Excellent. Thanks. And thanks for chiming in on that, because I think those were really important elements. And uh, Keisha, you had mentioned, uh, you know, just a, a few moments ago that you wanted to talk a bit more about the CBRS. Um, I've got uh, I've got this slide for you to to help provide some insights, and then we'll move into the 5G and the Wi-Fi 6 um, before we bring our program to a close. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as mentioned before, uh, CBRS is uh, uh, something uh, very uh, near and dear to us 
just because uh, it's it's revolutionizing the way you use a spectrum. So this is not a new spectrum. It is an existing uh, spectrum in 3.5 gigahertz. About 150 megahertz of space has been allocated uh, by FCC with a tiered model. Uh, so uh, the, the, where the entire 150 megahertz of spectrum can be used on a contention basis, anybody can go and deploy. An enterprise um, in the past uh, who could not uh, deploy a spectrum without uh, you know, uh, getting a, a license uh, for the spectrum, now they're actually free to go and deploy. So it opens amazing amount of uh, number of uh, use cases. And then FCC also um, has enabling the option to uh, auction the spectrum about 70 megahertz of this of this 150 megahertz uh, of spectrum would be auctioned, what's called as the PAL or the priority access uh, license. Anybody can go and bid for the spectrum come uh, June uh, 2020. And, and then of course, um, uh, once you have that, you can deploy uh, the spectrum in those areas. So, so the benefit of this type of a tiered model is that you can protect the incumbents so there's only about uh, less than 3% of the, uh, the, the entire U.S. Uh, geography that, that's covered by uh, the current 3.5 gigahertz uh, spectrum. So the 97% of the area is not covered. With this tiered model, FCC is really opening up to reuse the existing spectrum, which is allowing and propelling uh, the private LTE use cases. Excellent. And let's, uh, you know, do something similar for 5G and Wi-Fi 6 for our participants here. Yeah, I think so. To, to sum it up, um, as I mentioned before, 5G is really a, um, a combination and a, a complementary of uh, several uh, technologies and not, uh, not just a millimeter wave or what's going on uh, from a deployment perspective. Uh, as you can see, uh, IMT 2020 has come up with a certain uh, rules and guidelines and specifications um, which will tell uh, or which will classify a deployment as a 5G deployment. That's why you have carriers uh, in the low band as well as the mid band spectrum, like carriers in 600 megahertz, uh, you know, T-Mobile who can actually do a 5G deployment. As long as you follow these IMT 2020 specifications, meaning from a latency perspective, from a mobility perspective, um, the, the, the data rates perspective, any technology uh, can well be uh, um, augmented with uh, uh, 5G to provide that complementary effect. And I want to just mention one thing is that 802.11, which is basically a Wi-Fi technologies and Wi-Fi 6 uh, that's been uh, uh, proliferating the past year or so, is well suited to take advantage of that hand in hand, complementing the, um, the 5G uh, deployments with the operators especially in managed high capacity indoor venues which will complete the uh, the convergence of licensed and unlicensed technologies and finally uh, provide a seamless experience to the user and as i said before they don't really care where they're connected to as long as they're connected to and they have that seamless and secure experience excellent well, thank you. Thank you guys so much. As we bring our program to a close, um, I did have one last question for everyone. I wanted to know if our presentation helped you better understand the importance of a smartly designed converged network. Uh, while that is up on your screen, um, I did want to remind everyone that um, at the top of the program, I did mention that in August of 2019 that the HECnet Forum published a white paper titled DAS and Small Cells Evolve to meet today's and tomorrow's connectivity needs. The paper was authored by industry leaders from ADRF, Boingo, Comscope, and Zenfi Networks, and it did serve as a great basis for um, information for our program today. And uh, should you be interested to hear more, I definitely encourage you all to um, consider downloading that yourselves. I do have here on the screen information on how you could download that white paper so you can learn more about what we talked about today. Um, I also want to encourage you all to listen into uh, the Need As Live, where Wireline and Wireless Meet podcast. We do have our episode five, which just recently launched, featuring uh, one of Zenfine, Zenfi's own. Uh, it's called Connected Cities and the Horizontal Tower. So again, another perspective, uh, perhaps to provide you with some insights and information to, to get your head wrapped around some of these new concepts of this new network design that we're, we're facing as we move into the future. 
And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't thank you, Walter and Kishore, uh, for joining us today and for sharing your thoughts and your insights. Um, we do have a few more minutes um, for questions. And I see here that um, we've got a couple of questions in from our listeners. And the first question is that uh, we have a, um, one of our, our listeners is interested to hear your thoughts on the challenges for construction costs the speed to implement and providing quality power to radios with the increased numbers needed in uh, enabling mobile densification. So from being from Volt Server, you know, there's an obvious vested interest in that topic that was from this particular um, person. And so maybe, you know, Wally or Kishore, do you guys have any insights uh, as to what is involved with those costs? I, I can start. Um, I think that's a very um, um, good question and a key part of most of the installations and uh, deployment, uh, especially from a venue perspective is where I can uh, talk. Uh, most of the venues, when we uh, go and uh, deploy a particular technology, be it DAS or CRAN or, or a Wi-Fi uh, passpoint, uh, or CBRs for that matter, because we have deployments. Yes, the number one challenge we run into is um, the cabling, uh, the installation, uh, design, uh, planning. Uh, so uh, the, the, ch the key challenge we have besides uh, these usual suspects in a construction is that the network, unlike in the past, has to evolve with the current as well as the upcoming standards. So let's say that you go and deploy a, a, a DAS network now, and tomorrow down the line, a carrier wants to add either a CRAN or a DRAN at a new type of frequency. We can't go and redesign the network every single time. So one of the things that we have been trying to do, and we have been successful um, uh, in, in many of our deployments is to uh, make sure that the network um, has uh, this notion of um, a virtualization as much as uh, possible. In places where, uh, uh, let's say from a, a CRAN or a, a DAS or a DRAN perspective, rather than adding a lot of physical service, we try to virtualize them as much as possible. There's little we can do from a radio antenna perspective and the cabling perspective. Actually, there are a few things we can do over there too, but it's still a little early because the RAN is also getting uh, virtualized. You know, we have this concept of Open RAN and X RAN, which we also demonstrated in the the Mobile World Congress in uh, Los Angeles. But yes, so as long as you keep those uh, elements um, uh, with, with the concept of evolving uh, technologies and making changes, it's going to make the deployment a little easier. But still, tackling with the challenges of um, all of the construction is something that's always still a bottleneck. So um, you know, just to add, that's very good. I, I like what Keisha said. Uh, just to add a little bit from a strictly from a metropolitan, you know, dense environment like let's just say Manhattan or anywhere in New York City, um, probably we, what we, why we like to say we offer integrated solutions with space power and connectivity. Probably our biggest challenge is power. Um, oftentimes, when you're looking on deploying wireless solutions and in an outdoor environment. Um, oftentimes the power that is available may be across the street or not near the pole that where you want to deploy um, a wireless solution. So you have to bring power to it. Um, that involves restoration of the streets often, um, almost 100% of the time. It could involve, and it depends on what the municipality requires, so it could, drive the cost in the tens of thousands of dollars. So yeah, we run into specifically with power is one of our biggest issues um, and deploying these types of solutions. Excellent. Um, we do have another question and just a reminder for our attendees, uh, we just have a couple more minutes here. We will be answering this next question. If you have another one, please put that into the question window. We'll try to get to that before the top of the hour. In the meantime, um, the question is, will service providers be able to share or co-locate their technology and not need individual small cell poles for each provider? What what what's happening in the space out there from that perspective? <laughs> well, 
Well, I, I think that's a good question for the service providers. Um, mm -hmm. If from a Zenfi, Zenfi perspective, we would love that, right? Uh, I think there's there's some issues around it. Um, one is is as we're deploying more and more networks, uh, specifically in New York City, the um, designs that we the design constrictions on the poles often don't afford us the ability to have multiple carriers in every uh, on on a pole. So from that perspective, it's it's, it is uh, challenging, um, but sometimes we do have it happening. Uh, there's continue to be more and more uh, evolution of these designs, but today it's a it's it's a sometimes not the way that's happening in you know the urban environments uh, today. But it's it, it not yet, right? It's able to happen. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Excellent. Well, thank you both so much. Um, I think it's been in a very interesting uh, program. I hope everybody learns a little something and uh, we welcome your thoughts and your feedback. Um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.